Morning. Let's get started. Any questions? Do you need a session tomorrow morning at eight o'clock on that lab? How many of you will attend? Sam, let's introduce you to something called Simulink, which is an add-on product on that lab for graphically assembling block. It's very much like what you would do in Hysys, Saspen. Have you guys used Hysys, Saspen? Have you been exposed to simulating before? No, like it came with my package that I bought, but no. Okay. Um, you will like it better than MATLAB because you don't need to program anything. All visual. You just oh, nice. pull the modules and link them up, and then click on it, open up a set of parameters, and do the simulation. Yeah. So at the end of the lecture, if you forget, remind me. I will ask you whether you need more practice on that. If you do, we will meet tomorrow morning. Otherwise, we will meet Friday for the regular lecture. So the Thursday morning, you drive the process. You tell me that you need something, I'll be there and we will work through something. And if you can tell me ahead of time what areas you need help, I'll prepare for that. Otherwise, I'll come there and uh, answer any questions that you might have. Solution to the homework, this homework? Well, the next homework, yeah, this is my intention to give you the post the next homework, but it won't be due until after the exam. Well, hopefully I'll do it by this Friday for the next set of problems. And you may want to just take a look at it before the exam. When is the exam? The exam is uh, the Monday after the break week. Next week is the break, right? You get a break. So the Monday after that. So actually we'll have one Friday class next week. We won't have Monday and Wednesday, but we'll have a lecture on Friday. And uh, it's going to be a written exam, written exam in the class, uh, because I think there are still people who are not quite comfortable with MATLAB, no. so <laughs> we'll see how the town evolves. Uh, it's on Monday, uh, the Monday after you come back from holiday. Um, yeah, let me see. What exact date? It will be 22nd, yeah, Monday the 22nd. So there's no class on the 15th and 17th, and we will meet on the 19th. And uh, we'll probably cut off for the exam what we cover till this Friday. Okay. And uh, so on Friday, I'll put up a problem set, and it will be due 
after the exam, but uh, I would encourage you to take a look at it before. <laughs> All right. Um, in the last lecture, we started introducing this idea of a transfer function. And it's an important concept. And uh, most of the dynamical models, after we go through this process of linearization, in the real case of nonlinear processes, we can express them as the ratio of an output to an input. Okay? So the denominator is the input. And the numerator is the output. And that ratio can be expressed as a transfer function. An algebraic expression in the Laplace domain. It comes from a differential equation. You need to understand that. And uh, then if I have specified a certain type of input on the process, the transfer function transforms that input into an output. So the input will be the known quantity. The output is the one that I want to calculate. And the transfer function itself, in most cases, will be no. Now, there are some experiments where you might say, you might invert this problem, meaning I put a certain input into the process and then measure the output. Okay? So then you will know both input and output because you are measuring the output. And you can say, OK, what should be the transfer function that will transform this input to that particular output? And in the transfer function, as we saw, we will typically have time constants. For a first order process, we are going to have one time constant. So there will be some problems where your task will be, given the input and the output, back calculate what the transfer function is, or back calculate what the time constant is. But most of the time, you will know what the time constant is from the process description, if you have a good description of the process. Then you can predict. If I give you an input, you can predict what the output is going to be by solving this. And the block diagram representation of that typically is this is the output and that's the input. Xs is the input in the Laplace domain, Ys is the output, and G is the transfer function. That transfer function could represent a stirred tank, a heated tank, a reactor, a distillation column. And the transfer function could be very complex indeed. Okay? And we will see how to deal with such transfer functions, how to develop them, how to assemble from simple transfer functions for individual units two more complicated ones for a complex flow sheet, for example. Okay. So in the last class, we also talked about uh, various types of uh, inputs that we can think of. One would be the step input. Uh, the other one would be the pulse, the unit pulse, which goes to infinity at a certain amount of time. And then the third one is the sinusoidal one. Okay. What Simulink does is represents all these blocks and lines that are connecting the blocks uh, graphically on a white sheet that you are given, and then specify the transfer functions, the inputs, and look at the output. And we will go through that process today. Okay? But the traditional process you should be aware of. Most likely, most of the time, you will be using simulators like Aspen or Hysis or Simulink kind of uh, simulator. Okay? Um, because that makes your job easier, but you should have a good understanding of what is underlying that simulator. And that's the reason why we are doing the theory behind it. So we, you need to know what a transfer function is, what a time function is, how those are obtained. So in this particular case, we said if the input is a step input, that is uh, x is given by a step input, then its Laplace transform is A over S. And this is G, the transfer function for the process that is given to you. So the output in the Laplace domain is going to be simply A over tau divided by S times S plus 1 over tau. I'm simply rearranging that transfer function expression. Okay? So that is a specific output for the step, specific input of a step change. Then you do your uh, traditional uh, partial fractions, or you use I Laplace, and you can get the output in the time domain by, you, by using the I Laplace on this expression. And you can then plot it and uh, see how the response looks like. And we did that in the last slide as well. So the step input is going to be like this. And the response is going to be something like this. Okay. So there is always a delay. And we talked about what, how to speed up the response, what should be the time constant. So this is a graph that you will typically get. 
this is a normalized graph that you can use for any step input because this is for unit step. The amplitude, the output amplitude is scaled with respect to A. So on the y axis you have y over A. On the next x axis you have T over tau. tau scale with respect to time constant. Yeah. Graphically, in this graph, you mean? Yeah. This graph has nothing to do with the transfer function. It was generated by a transfer function. But this graph represents in the time domain what the output response is going to look like. If I put in, if I put in a step change at this point on the input, remember, this is the problem that we are dealing with, g of s, x of s. Okay, this is the transfer function. This is the input. So if the input is a red curve that I've shown you, a step input, then y of s will be the output. And that output is given by this expression that you have here. This is the output in the Laplace domain. On that function, you use i Laplace, or you use partial fractions to invert it. And that is the response in that time domain, So y as a function of t. So the graph that you see is a graph of this particular equation. 1 minus t to the power t over tau. Okay, what we have done is we have written this as y over a is equal to 1 minus e to the power minus t over tau. Okay, So when t equal to 0, for example, e to the power 0 is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. That's why the graph is at this point. As t goes to infinity, this goes to 0. So the graph goes towards 1. Okay, So this is a time response of that, that transfer function, a first order transfer function. The first order transfer function comes from a first order differential equation. So it always has the form of 1 over tau s plus 1. This would be the first order transfer function form. Okay. So this graph is in the time domain the response of a first order system, a typical first order system. In this particular case, we started off by looking at a thermometer. How does a thermometer, mercury thermometer, respond when you make a step change from 90 degrees to 100 degrees, for example? How does the temperature uh, in the uh, mercury increase? It increases like that. And in the last class, I pointed out, and I asked you the question, I guess, if you want a faster response, if you want a response that looks something like this, what do you have to do? The answer was you need to reduce this time constant. Tau is the time constant. Okay, So tau appears here. So for example, try to interpret this graph. If I want to reach 80% of the steady state, okay, the steady state is 1. When I make a step change, the final steady state is going to be at 1. Okay, So if I want to reach 80% towards that steady state, how long does the process take? So in order to answer this question, all you need to do is go to 80% and then come down and read what the time is. So the time, for example, t over tau is of the order of 1.5 or 1.6. Okay. Now, if you make tau to be 0.1, what would t be? Tau is 0.1. Okay. So t is going to be 1.5 times tau. So if tau is 0.1, t is going to be 0.15. If tau is 10, t is going to be 15. Okay, So if tau is larger, the real time t is going to take longer. If tau is 10, it will take 15 seconds to reach 80% of the steady state. That is, if tau is 0.1, then t is going to take 0.15 seconds to reach the same 80%. That's why we say that we want the time constant to be as small as possible for the response to be quick, Okay, for the system to respond. Uh, very quickly to any change that you make, okay, step change that you make. Any questions on that? Okay. And uh, we went through this problem, and I was going to start doing the MATLAB. So I'm going to now illustrate how to do the same thing in um, MATLAB using some new functions. The two functions that I want to introduce to you are TF and STEP. TF trans stands for transfer function. So you would start MATLAB, and uh, you would enter terms uh, S, T, X, T, yeah. Okay, I'm 
defining these symbols. And uh, TF is the transfer function. And the way to use the transfer function, I need to explain what, what is happening here. The transfer function takes two input arguments. Any natural function will take a certain number of input arguments, produce a certain number of output arguments. Okay? You should get used to that idea by now. There are thousands and thousands of built-in functions in MATLAB. TF is one such function. Okay? And it takes two inputs. The first input is the coefficients of the polynomial in the numerator of this transfer function. So in this particular case, the transfer function I'm going to do is 1 divided by 0.1s plus 1. Okay. The time constant is 0.1, and this is the first order transfer function. First order transfer function meaning first order polynomials in the denominator. Okay. So in the numerator, I'm going to represent the coefficients of any polynomial. This pf is a very general transfer function. So you could take, for example, in general, g could be a1 s to the power 3 plus a2 s to the power 2 plus a3 s plus a4 divided by b1 s to the power 5 plus b2 s to the power 4, etc. As long as the transfer functions are expressible as a ratio of two polynomials, this form of Tf will take the coefficients of those polynomials in that order, in the numerator. And the second one is from the denominator. In this particular case, the only coefficient in the numerator is 1. And there are two coefficients in the denominator. Okay? So there is 0.1 and 1. So you're going to enter the, these two uh, coefficients of the polynomials in the numerator and denominator. And that defines your transfer function. Any question on that? Yeah. That's a very good question. Uh, you may not have always this form, but most of the uh, transfer functions will have these ratio of polynomials. That's because they are coming from uh, linear time invariant differential equations. So if I have a flat order differential equation, when I write the characteristic root, I'm going to get a third degree polynomial. That will appear in the denominator. Okay. So most of the time you'll have. So it's a very commonly found. No, this uh, that's a good question. Uh, there is an equivalence between a higher order system and a system of first order equations. So if you have three first order equations, you are going to get three transfer functions. Each one will be a first order transfer function. And we will show later on, we can take the product of this. Like if I, if I have, since you asked the question, let me respond to it. Suppose I have two processors. G1 and G2, two first order processes. This could be one is a tank, the other one is a reactor, for example. So this has an input, Y, and this is X1. This is, uh, sorry, this is, I'm calling X as the input, right? My apologies. I don't want to confuse you with my symbols. Okay. So I will this I will call X, and this I will call Y1 and this I would call y2. So this idea of the output y1 is equal to g1 times x1. Okay? That is for the first process. Then you will have y2 as equal to g2 times y1 because y1 is the input to the second one. So you can replace this y1 and write it as g1 times g2 times we will learn how to do this in a routine fashion. So we can define a new transfer function, which is a product of two transfer functions. That's what would happen. When you have a two, three first order systems, you will eventually get a product of these transfer functions, which will still be ratios of polynomial. Okay? So as long as this effective product is a ratio of a polynomial, you will still be able to use this form of TF. To the, to the No, the G also, uh, this TF function it works only for a linear time invariant system. Okay? So in general, as chemical engineers, we will be dealing with nonlinear systems all the time. Reactions, most of the reactions, start of first order reaction, second order reaction is going to be a nonlinear one. 
thermodynamic, then Gravitz is equation of state, is a nonlinear equation of state. Right? Fluid mechanics, then you have pressure drop versus flow rate in turbulent regime, which depends on velocity squared. So nonlinearity there. So most of the chemical processes are nonlinear. Okay? So one of the important things that we have to see is how to linearize the model. And we will do that later on, uh, pretty soon sure, uh, in the course. And uh, that linearized model still works for control simply because most of the processes work on steady state. So around the steady state, we can linearize the model and develop the control algorithm. But if you have a batch polymer reactor, then we need to go for nonlinear control, nonlinear model. Okay? So we have a lot of what we will see in this course is mostly for linear systems. Any other questions? Okay, so G equals TF one comma zero point one phase one. Okay, so the first argument is the polynomial, which is just a constant in the numerator, and the second argument is the polynomial in the denominator. In this case, it's a linear polynomial, first degree straight line, basically. Point, so the first coefficient is point 0.1, which multiplies f, and the second coefficient is 1. So it created the transfer function for me. Okay? Now, if you look at the variable list, <coughs> you will see that tf is defined as a new type of variable. So MATLAB can create many, many different types of variables. Simple double variable, meaning uh, numerical variable which, which can carry up to 15 significant digits, or symbols, which you have seen before. So S, T, and X are all defined as symbolic variable in this case. But G is a new kind of variable. It's called the TF, a class is transfer function. So if I type TF, it says it's an empty transfer function. And if I, sorry, if I say G, it gives me the transfer function, it calls the transfer function for me. Okay? Uh, then what do I do? I need to invert the transfer function, right? Uh, I, now, MATLAB has several built-in routines for actually generating output directly from the transfer function. One is STEP. STEP is a, trans uh, is a function that takes as input a transfer function object. If you call STEP and put anything else, it is complain. For example, if I say STEP 0.1, to complain because it doesn't know what to do with 0 0.1. What it expects as an input is a transfer function object, a well-defined transfer function with polynomials in the numerator and denominator. Okay? So if I say step G, it will be happy with it because it takes that, analyzes the transfer function, and what does it do? It does a series of things. The things that we have seen uh, in the notes, for example, it will replace, it will take G, and it will multiply it by the step function. Okay? So I'm just going to go back and show you all the steps. So it takes G, it multiplies it by this 1 over F, 1 being a unit step change. Okay? It takes the inverse Laplace transform, and it generates the plot. So it produces the output directly for you by doing all these steps, taking the transfer function, multiplying it by the step input, and taking the inverse Laplace transform and plotting it. Okay. So all I need to do is enter that G, and I'm going to get a graph. Because we're doing all these things, it's taking a while, I think. <laughs> there, there you have your graph. Okay. And look at it on the y-axis. It is one, zero to one, because I put a unit step change. Okay. On the x-axis is that time. It picks automatically a random uh, range of numbers, uh, 0 to 0 0.6, for example. Now, if I do this, what do you think will happen? What am I doing? I'm taking the step function, multiplying it by 10 times g. Can anybody guess what might happen? 0 to 10. That's what's going to happen. The function will now be scaled because what I'm saying is the step change is not unit step change, but I'm making from 0 to 10. So in that particular problem, the mercury thermometer was inserted initially at 90 degrees and then at 100 degrees. So step change is 10 degrees. Okay. 
So if I now want to answer the question, when will it reach 98 degrees, all I need to do is look at this point and then read the graph from there. Okay? In about 0.12 seconds, it's going to reach 98 degrees, from 98 degrees to 98 degrees. Okay? Any questions on that? Um, but by default, MATLAB and this function assumes time as a unit of seconds. Okay. Um, yeah, but it's just going to change the scale. So it's a matter of interpreting what one unit of time means. You can say in your own mind, if I put, for example, 0.1 in minutes, I can interpret this as instead of seconds, minutes. If 0.1 represents hours, I can just replace this by from seconds to hours because it is, in a sense, uh, the universe is arbitrary, right? So as long as you're consistent in your interpretation, what decides the time is the units that you use for tau. If tau is 0.1 minutes, then everything is in terms of minutes. If tau is in 0.1 hour, it is in terms of hours. Okay, so let's ask for help. This is something I want you to do. Last night I got an email from one of the students um, about something that I said. Who was it? You. <laughs> very good. I was very happy to uh, receive that email. Uh, basically saying, what I said in the class, if you remember, is um, MATLAB cannot handle higher order systems. So we transfer that into a first order system of the equations and OD45 will handle that. I was not quite accurate about it. Um, the ODE four, what I should have said, I guess, is ODE four five can handle any number of first order equations of any type of nonlinearity. Okay? There is another function called D solve, and D solve can solve analytically, not numerically. ODE four five solves it numerically, but D solve can solve analytically any order differential equation, but it has to be constant coefficient, linear, time invariant. That's basically what it was is finding the characteristic rules, finding the eigenvalue, and MATLAB can do all those things. So MATLAB can solve a higher order differential equation. Then you pointed out a very nice example of how it does that. Okay. Um, I want all of you to be able to do these things. Go and find out how and tell me about what types of function can do that I didn't know. That will really make me happy. Okay. So the transfer function here gives you one of the things, uh, many people, including myself, in early stages find frustrating is deciphering their very cryptic help. <laughs> okay? Because the help is very complex. And if you know what you're doing about initially, then you will understand all these things. But a lot of the things that they say here will not make sense to you. Okay? So the learning process is a slow process. Okay? So the first thing I've kind of told you, sim equals tf num comma den. <laughs> what, is, what do these mean? Numerator and denominator, that's what they're saying. So they are explaining what num and den are. Num uh, and uh, denominator den. Okay? And so uh, is the output which is transfer function object. Now you might wonder, what is an object? Right? So I, I showed you that and here, for example, it treats g as a transfer function object. So you cannot do simple arithmetic with it. Only certain functions can deal with that object. TF is one. Okay, TF expects that. And uh, another interesting thing that I just learned last night while looking for this class is uh, this way. There are many ways of doing the transfer function. Okay, one would be to say S is equal to TF within quotation mark S. I'm now talking about this is what we learned just now. I'm now talking about this. So these things are not even going to look at now. Because they refer to something called um, discrete model. We are now doing the continuous model, differential equation and their solutions. Okay? So T is a continuous time variable. Now there are something called uh, discrete uh, sample variable models where you know events only occurring at certain times, 0.1 second, 0.2 second, etc. We can build models. Towards the end of the course, we will talk about them. The same transfer function can handle discrete time modeling as well. Okay. So we are not going to really worry about what the big transformers or what the big transformers are. But this is the useful thing now. Specify the transfer function uh, in the Laplace variable. 
Okay, so let's just try and see uh, how that might work. The good part of the, and then there are a lot of things. Nemo, what is Nemo? We don't know yet. Nemo stands for multiple input, multiple output. So right now we are talking about single input to a process and a single output, and those are called CISO, FISO. These are a lot of acronyms that you will come across in control codes. Okay, so if you don't understand everything in the house you should have the ability to kind of zoom into what you want and get out and forget about the rest. Okay, selectively filter out things that don't make sense. If they don't make sense and it is not important for you to understand it, just ignore it. Okay? But that's not easy. Uh, I've said that it's not easy to do. Okay, so sims s okay, uh, and then I'm saying s equals tf Okay. So as if identified that I'm going to define the transfer function in terms of x. Okay. Then I can say g is equal to 1 divided by 0 0.1, sorry, 0 0.1x plus 1. Another way of defining the same transfer function. So you don't have to worry about what is the numerator and what is the denominator. If you have a particular analytical expression for the transfer function, then this process will get you the same thing. That's the kind of thing you're going to use x in the transfer function variable as a And then just write out any function like this and it takes that as a transfer function. Any questions? Yeah. So based on what the transfer function is, when you apply it, Uh, good question, good question. G need not be a first order system. G could be a second order, third order system. What the step function does is step function takes whatever G is, multiplies it by a step input, which is 1 over S or 10 over S or whatever, depending on the step change. Is it a unit step change or a larger step change? Okay. So whatever the transfer function is, it will multiply it by X. So the step function basically takes G as an input. That's why we have the freedom to define G any way you want. But the step function will multiply that by always the step input, which is 1 over S. And then it can take the I last class of that product, which is your output. Okay? Am I making that clear or not? Because the relationship is Y is equal to G times X in general. G is your transfer function. X is your input. Okay, so there are several types of inputs that we saw, step, impulse, and sinusoidal. So the step function in MATLAB, STEP, takes this G, multiplies it by 1 over S, because that is a Laplace transform of a unit step function, right? And then it can take the product, and it has the output Y. Y is, this is what I said when I said in Laplace domain, these are algebraic operations. Okay, from a differential domain, I have derived what G is. And X is simply the input. And if I consider a step input, then the product is my output in the Laplace domain. Then I can take I Laplace, which takes me to the time domain. I can call a plot routine to generate the plot. That's exactly what TF does. TF takes any G that you give. It need not be first order. It can be second order, third order. But when you say step, it's going to apply only the step input, which is 1 over S. Now, we can ask a few questions at this stage. Is there an impulse? Right? I suppose there is. Um, normally, what would happen is when you look at help for step, it says, see also these things. And I would look for impulse there <laughs> to see whether there is an impulse function because it normally directs you to related functions. If not, let's open up the document page and see whether this is basically the same help written in a nicer form. And there are nicer examples with pretty printing there.
I guess I don't see it, so let me search for it. <laughs> Once you go into the document mode, you can actually search for various variables. Impulse function there. There it is. Impulse this. Okay. Calculates the unit impulse response of a linear system. Okay. So what you could do is let's try this. Okay. So I have G defined. If I say impulse G, what do I get? Get a graph. Does that graph make sense? What is an impulse response? It takes it immediately to a certain energy level, okay, and then the system decays, goes back. Whereas a step change is forcing a new steady state, okay. So this was the original steady state, and that is a new steady state. So the step change takes you from an old steady state to a new steady state. That's an impulse response, takes you to infinity and brings it back. Okay? So the system is going to respond gradually like this. You are kicking the system and then it's going to go back, recover to its old steady state. So a typical impulse response should be a decaying one. Okay? And so that's what that particular graph shows. Any questions? That was the unit impulse, right, yeah. Okay, so that's what I was going to talk about next. For a unit impulse, the transform variable is one. Okay, the Laplace transform of a unit impulse function is simply one. The Laplace transform of the step function is one over s, but for an impulse function it is only simply one. So y is going to be simply g, because x is one. Now you need to take the inverse Laplace transform and then generate the graph. And that's what uh, the impulse function does for you. One is the Laplace transform of the impulse function. The impulse function is basically going to infinity and coming back. And that is in your table, in the table of Laplace transform, which will be given to you in the exam. Okay? So you should know where to look for in the table for various kinds of uh, forcing. Okay, so this is the uh, output given in terms of G times the input, but in this case the input is simply 1. Okay, so the output is simply 1 over tau s plus 1. Okay, so if you want to do it analytically by yourself without MATLAB help, what you need to do is take the inverse Laplace transform of this function, and that is this from the table, okay? So you will get this uh, solution as uh, uh, tau times y is equal to e to the power minus t over tau, yeah? Um, I mean, like, the last transform of the constant is 1 over s, but then what would be corresponding thing that you want? The constant. Well, like, Oh, for the impulse transform, yeah. For the impulse, the unit impulse transform says that in an instance of time, I'm going to add unit energy. So the area of the integral under the impulse time response is 1. Now, if it is not 1, if it is A, then the Laplace transform will simply be A. Instead of 1, it will be A. The Laplace transform of uh, which table? Let me see. Let me open the table and we'll see. Uh, I don't know which lecture was it. Do you remember? Fine. Okay. So the first one is the unit step change. Okay. So the Laplace transform of that is one over S. Um, unit impulse, the last one. So the first one and the last one. Okay. So the unit impulse Laplace transform is one. Now, if this area were not one, if it were ten, then the Laplace transform of that will be just ten. Okay. Now, what do I mean by that area being ten? 
I think I have an example now that will explain that. Okay? Yeah. Which figure? I was, I was hoping somebody will ask that question. I don't know what they're going to ask. Why is it 10? Good question. The answer to that is in the solution itself. Okay. So this is why doing it analytically by hand one makes you get a deeper understanding of what is happening. Otherwise, we all can very quickly learn to punch buttons here and there, get graphs. But if you ask the question, why is it 10? Okay. I just put a unit impulse response. Okay. Why is it 10? I need to look at the solution to this. Look at the solution. Tau times y is e to the power minus t over tau. So the y of t is equal to 1 over tau e to the power minus t over tau. Tau is 0.1. That's why it's 10. Okay? Good, good observation. Good. Any other questions? Okay. So if you had a unit impulse response with unit time constant, the t would be the same as tau. Okay. Then you'll get a decaying like this. That's a graph of this particular function, and that's what impulse response uh, does. Okay. I have an example here. I'm not going to have time today to get into Simulink. Um, do you want to meet tomorrow to go through Simulink? Okay, tomorrow morning I will introduce you to uh, Simulink. Um, okay. Uh, it is an add on feature to MATLAB. And. Uh, <laughs> I think they have it. Yeah, they have it. Okay. I think I need to talk about sinusoidal. Maybe we can do that tomorrow. Let me just introduce the idea of the link now. Okay. So this is a MATLAB interaction. You enter commands and it takes it and uh, plots it out for you. Now, Simulink is invoked either by typing Simulink or by looking at that uh, icon on the top, Simulink, and just click on that. Then it's a completely graphical interaction. You don't write commands. You don't worry about commands. But MATLAB is already structured as every function requiring some input and producing some output. Now we can represent this graphically in Simulink. So Simulink is an add-on box that is good for people who hate programming. They don't want to write a function. Okay? Because you can just define objects on the screen. So what you will do is, when you start Simulink, you will get the Simulink library browser. So it has a whole library of many, many types of modules. You just take the module and put it into your worksheet. So the first thing that you need to do is open a new model. Okay. When you say open a new model, it gives you a blank white sheet. This is very similar to what you would have done in Aspen and Hyper. Okay. And on the flow sheet, they're going to draw various process units and put in. Here we are going to draw various modules. Okay? So let's do the module that we just did by MATLAB, now the step function, for example. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at continuous function. This takes a while to know because the library is huge. There are probably 2,000 modules in there. Okay? So among the continuous functions, I'm going to look for a function that does it obviously does integration 1 over x, for example, the class of integrator. And we'll talk about state state models later on. But right now we want you to focus on transfer function models. Okay? So that module allows you to define any transfer function. So just grab that. Now this is where if you do it on the computer room, it will help because what I'm going to do is take the mouse and drag it by while pressing a certain key. If you need to get familiar with this um, way of dragging and dropping things. Okay. What you're seeing is I've done drag and drop, but what did I do? You need to do a practice with the mouse on that one. Okay. So this is the tra transfer function module, and it has an input and an output that I can connect to. Okay. So I'm going to take an input. Let me just ask whether it's a guess. 
from this list of things, wherever they find that input or input input, from the name, you are able to decipher or guess where it should be. What is that input? It's the source of something, right? So the place that I would look for is source. Similarly, the output will be a sink. Okay? So I, I need to open up the source module. And there I will find a constant input, a clock. There are many, many things. I don't know about all of them. Okay? So this is the key that you need to focus on what you need and get that. And forget about others and filter them out. So what I want is a step function. So I'm just going to go around, look around. And there I have a step function. Okay? So I take that and I drop it in there. It has an output. So I take the cursor, create near that, click the mouse and drag it along and connect it. Okay? So I've connected the input to the transfer function. On the output side, on the sync side, I want it to generate a graph. So there is something called a scope, okay? a display unit. Okay? So where is the scope there? So I take that and drop it on the other side, and then I connect that. So I have a simple input-output model with a transfer function. Now I need to define the time constant. I need to define the magnitude of the step change, etc. How do I do that? I just go into a particular module and double-click on that. It opens up a uh, form that I need to fill out. Okay? So there it says the coefficient, coefficient. This is very familiar already. Well, all it is is a front end to the TF routine. So this is going to call the TF routine for you. But you don't need to know anything about the TF routine. Okay? So for example, I put this as 0 0.1. Okay? And say yeah, okay. So the transfer function, I don't know whether you can see it, it's too small, isn't it? Let me see whether I can go with that. Hmm. There is a way to zoom it in, but I don't uh, <laughs> You, thank you. you. Yeah. Is it any better? <laughs> you can see that transfer function now. We have defined the transfer function at point one. Sorry. I always have a problem because of the resolution, isn't it? Oh my goodness, I'm running out of time. So double click on the step function. Okay, that you need to be able to, once you know what a step function is, you can interpret what are the inputs there. What is the step time? What could it mean? It says one, it has a default value. Let's just take the default value and maybe see whether you can interpret what it means. Initial value is zero, final value is one. What does that mean? Step change. It's a unit step change. Okay? So let's just accept the default values as they are. And to run the simulator, so you have built a simulator, okay? To run the simulator, you have this uh, icon there, with the arrow, start simulation. So to finish the simulation, now to finish the simulation, so double click on the scope, it opens the graph. And this one, you can zoom it in. What do you see? This is the response, the output response of a unit chap input to that particular transfer function. Okay? Now, can you explain what was, with that we will wrap up, what was this one step time? Look carefully here. The exactly. It waited. So the step change was not applied at time zero, it was applied at time one. Okay? So that, that's why it's starting to raise at one. Okay? So if you go back and say, no, I want to apply the step change at time zero. Okay? Then you just change that and rerun the simulation. And then reopen the scope and zoom it in. 
and you see the step change occurs at zero. Okay? And there are many other things, uh, many little icons that we need to learn as we go along. Okay? But it simply ways us task even further for what lab MATLAB task. Okay? So graphically you can represent different units and then do the simulation. We will stop there. Thank you. So we will meet tomorrow at uh, 8 o'clock with a simulating session. Okay? Yes. 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 <laughs> but I'm not recording those sessions. The practice one. I prepare something. Yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.